Our first rankings for week six, they kick things off at the running back position and a special guest, Sam Sherman, you know from, from this channel, the waivers episode every single Monday night is filling in for Hayden this week. Sam, uh, as always, we need to note for the people out there, I've learned the Chiefs, the Rams, the Vikings, and the Dolphins are on bye weeks. So no Kareem Hunt for you, no Kyron Williams, no Aaron Jones, and you don't have to deal with the headache that is Devon Achan, Raheem Mostert, and Jalen Wright at the same time. And then also with these rankings, they're on Wednesdays. So like we don't totally know, Sam, the status of the likes of Jonathan Taylor, Joe Mixon, and Zach Moss. So are you just choosing to leave them out of these rankings? Yeah, those were the assumptions I made early on. Based on practice reports we have, uh, it seems like Taylor, Moss, and Mixon won't go. So we'll get to those situations uh, for the backup running backs there as we go through it. But if you're wondering where they are in the rankings, I'm currently making the assumption that they are out. And none of them feature on Thursday. That is San Francisco. That is Seattle. So you can always check back in on the Start Sit Show that I'll be running for an hour around 1130 Eastern on Sunday morning uh, for those names. Cause there are other ones. There's like Devlin Singletary. There's a few others that yeah. are still uh, in the ether, the unknown. All right. One through eight, nine through 16, so on and so forth. The top 36 running backs here. And as always, we will build a pick em entry. The best way for you to follow that and to join along is to click the link in the description down below, enter promo code, the show, or just click the pin comment. We'll, we'll have that pick em entry built along the way. So Saquon Barkley is your running back one. This against the Cleveland Browns. Saquon Barkley has been a revelation and everyone who faded him, uh, even including me who did not draft him enough, but still like Saquon Barkley looks a bit foolish for kind of doubting one of the best running backs in the league going to one of the best situations in the league. Yeah, this one was easy for me and I agree with you there. I was not all over Saquon Barkley this season. That feels like a huge mistake. You kind of look at um, any of your favorite projection sources. Saquon Barkley is close to the top, almost in a tier of his own. Uh, this yeah. week ahead of the next couple of names we're going to talk about. His role is just so, so strong. He's involved in the passing game a little bit. He gets a ton of rushing attempts. He gets some goal line work that people were worried about with the tush push stuff earlier this season. But yeah, all of that combined, really good role. This Cleveland defense, while we had high expectations coming into the season, they've been pretty exploitable. They're actually um, in the bottom 10 in terms of rush yards allowed per game this season yep. and you look at the betting lines the eagles are favored by almost 10 points i think nine or ten depending on what you look at right now so this sets up for a really good saquon barkley script in this game yeah as you pointed out the browns have allowed 4.7 yards per carry to running backs explosive run rate on top of that at 17 percent uh, that's 30th in the league we've seen a bunch of explosive runs from saquon barkley against even better defenses than this yeah the the browns thing i do believe like early in games are good and then they realize that they have to fight their end of the battle with Deshaun Watson being the quarterback in offense. And I know this is somewhat walking down narrative street, but how can it not impact you that like, Hey, I'm doing my job for three quarters. And then the offense is just not doing there. So in the fourth quarter, uh, I'm just not as good. I'm not as good as I was yeah, that uh, quick question for you. I brought this up. Not on the waiver show, but on stats versus film that coming out of the bye week Jalen Hurts is quarterback 12 in points per game. To me, this is like the ultimate, ultimate buy low spot for, for him who he could finish as like top five, top six, if not even better than that at the quarterback position. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm with you there. I mean, a lot of those games that we have with Jalen Hurts so far without A.J. Brown, without Devonta Smith, even without both of them in like one and right. a half games this year. So, yeah, I think he's really good by low. Still a top four quarterback, like pretty, pretty easily for me. All right. Uh I hate to do this to you, but the comments are going to be very frustrated because your running back two is Bijan Robinson. <laughs> Our commenters want him ranked closer to running back 12 than running back two. Uh, he, in fact, he's running back five in consensus rankings this week against the Carolina Panthers on the road. So why the conviction here, Sam? The Carolina Panthers. You said it in the question. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> what else is there to say? Um, I know you know this, Josh. The Panthers. Yes can't do anything on defense. They can't stop anyone. Uh, I don't expect their offense to do that well in this game either. Although obviously they've been better with Andy Dalton. It still hasn't been amazing on that side of the ball. Again, bottom six defense in terms of rush yards allowed per game. The Falcons offense looked a lot better in week five. They're favored by six points in this one. I know we we probably said it before. We probably predicted this a million times. And I forget if it's you or Hayden that has this stat that Bijan's only been like a top five running back once in his career or something crazy like that. Yeah. 
put me on the record. It's gonna it's gonna happen again this week. We're gonna get the big Bijan week. And yeah, if if I'm wrong, people in the comments, uh, go ahead and roast me. We'll see what happens. Yeah, then we won't invite you back. How about that? Uh, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. He, he's running back six or 26, I should say. He is running back 26 in points per game right now. And yeah, I I'm, said the exact same thing. Top five, top six score this week in stats versus film. And Hayden acted like I insulted him. So uh, yeah, I mean, this year he has finished no better than running back 15 on a single week. Uh, Rich Rebar in the worksheet had an incredible stat. And I thought it was very telling. Caleb McGarry returned last week. As we all know, he's a right tackle for the Atlanta Falcons. Bijan goes from 4.9 yards per carry when Caleb McGarry is in the ballgame hmm. versus 2.4 yards per carry when he's without it. And if you go and just watch the games, so much outside zone that the and off tackle runs that the Atlanta Falcons are running. And obviously, Caleb McGarry is a, a pretty important and impactful. I mean, the Panthers are so bad that this doesn't have to just be a Bijan Robinson game. It can also be a Tyler Algier game. Yeah, we'll we'll get to him later on, I think. Um, okay. But yeah, I, I agree with that. I think there could be they could easily lead the league in rush attempts this week. That wouldn't surprise me at all. I know Atlanta went really pass happy this past week, but I expect that to change quite a bit against Carolina. Jordan Mason, you're running back three. This is at the Seattle Seahawks again. This is Thursday night football. Make sure you put him in your running back spot. Uh, this is all rushing, like. Jordan Mason has two or fewer catches in every single game this year. So while we're getting so much of the rushing production that Christian McCaffrey got, and while Jordan Mason is easily a top five, top six running back for as many weeks as he is starting, it's still not quite that CMC legendary player just because of the receiving stuff. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, the rush attempt workload has been in sort of legendary status. You could say he has second in the NFL in terms of share of his team's rush attempts, that's 69%. That's bested only by Kyron Williams. But like you pointed out, his target share of 5%, that's not even like a top 36 number at the position. I think he's below guys like Derrick Henry, James Conner, you know, guys you don't think of as pass catching back. So yeah, you, you're right. You summed it up well. This is just a guy who's going to get nearly all of the running back rush attempts on the 49ers, Debo Samuel will mix in with a couple carries. Maybe, you know, Isaac Guerrero will maybe get a couple as well, but they trust Mason. He's playing really well. You look at any efficiency metric and he's going to rank towards the top of the NFL in rushing this year. And Seattle is a team that's shown they can be exploited um, both yep. on the ground and through there the past couple of weeks after starting off fairly hot to start the season on defense. They've had two straight weeks where they've just been, exposed by the lions and the giants in weeks four and five. So yeah, I like this as a bounce back spot for the 49ers. I think they can keep a lead here against the Seahawks and Jordan Mason will get his touches. And even Leonard Williams did return along that defensive line for the Seahawks last week. Byron Murphy, the rookie is still out and he's awesome, but still it's not like they're totally depleted along that defensive front and Tyrone Tracy still ran all over them. One note I did have is San Francisco right now. I mean, this is unexpected. 29th in red zone touchdown success rate. Again, maybe this is just me galbraining a little bit, but I, I think that the lack of a CMC receiving threat in those tight spaces in that tight area of the field does kind of change their success in that area too. And again, I think Jordan Mason is one of the pure runners in the league, maybe top 20 at that. I mean, he's, he's such a good pure runner of the football, but when in, they get into condensed situations, the lack of the CMC stuff, I think, does does impact them. Okay, I screwed up because I forgot that Bijan was so much higher for you than consensus rankings. Mm -hmm. Which of these do you want to take? My eye immediately jumps to like this 15 and a half longest rush as a higher. Oh, yeah. I, I like that one a lot. I would say either that one or the rushing yards total. I just feel really good about it. Yeah. The Falcons running the ball a ton versus the Panthers. Well, so let's yeah. just take the 65 and a half. And again, yeah. you can change this if you want to up to 69 and a half, 79 and a half. I mean, you can keep going higher and higher. <laughs> I mean, if, if you think he's going to go higher than I like that rushing one. yards, you get a 2.75 X. Okay, we're yeah. going to do that. Why not? Yeah. We're going to have a scorcher it. here. Let's do that one. All right. We'll keep it moving. You're running back four, who's actually running back one in consensus rankings, is Derrick Henry. This is against the Washington Commanders. I'm definitely not going to say out loud that you don't like him as much as consensus because you obviously do. He's a top four runner. Uh, it just shows you the respect that he has across the industry right now that he's listed as the top guy in many spots. 
Yeah, he he's absolutely balling. And honestly, like two through four here, I'm not going to get any in any arguments with someone who wants to rank Henry above Bijan or above Mason. I, I kind of view it as Barkley slightly in a tier of his own, and then the next three names here are very very close. Derek Henry, what what else can you say about how well he's playing this season? Clearly, you know, reports of him being washed were extremely overblown. He's still got that high-end speed. He's still got that tackle-breaking ability. My my one concern here and, like, the minor tiebreaker for why I had him below Bijan and Mason is just the lack of involvement in the pass game and his ability to get scripted out in games where Baltimore is losing we saw that yeah. in a couple of weeks this season. Justice Hill will play a ton of snaps in those type of scenarios. And the commander's offense has been hot enough. I know Baltimore is still favored by like a touchdown in this game. But I think we got to take the commander's offense pretty seriously. We get into a weird game script where they get out in front and Baltimore's chasing points. Suddenly, Henry doesn't look quite as good as these other names here. But yeah, not going to talk negatively about the big dog. No. Like lo- Obviously, lock win your lineups this week. But I, I do want to focus in that point because I had the exact same one written down. Again, we expect the Ravens to win this game heavily. They're favored by six and a half. They're at home. They're projected for a slate high 29 points in this game. But it really, really is starting to be a real thing when that they are losing, when they are trailing. Derrick Henry just doesn't even see the field. Like Justice Hill has outsnapped Derrick Henry 67 to 33 when Baltimore is trailing, right? Um, Henry only played eight snaps with two touches in the third and fourth quarters of games that they've played catch up in, you know? Mm -hmm. So Justice Hill was conversely in for 24 of those snaps. So it's it's pretty, pretty eye-opening when you dig into that. And so maybe for other games, it matters more. But like you said, it could be a sneaky game. It does matter here because the commander's offense has really just been so fantastic so far. Agreed. And yeah, we've seen Baltimore's defense get beaten up on a couple times this season as well. So yeah, we'll see what happens. Right. But And actually the commander's defense allowing the league high 5.28 yards per carry to running backs, which, uh, yeah, I think if we get 5.2 yards per carry for Derek Henry this week, <laughs> we'd all feel pretty good about it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Alvin Kamara is your running back five. This against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Talk to me. Yeah, this one is just tough because we have a huge offensive environment change. Derek Carr is set to miss a couple games now with an oblique injury. That means it's either going to be Spencer Rattler or Jake yep. Hayner, I believe, for the Saints at quarterback. We've seen what can happen with these offenses that go to the backup quarterbacks without much experience or without much talent. Miami's offense completely fell off a cliff. Now, Kamara, obviously, he has like the, the target earning, like PPR scam ability that keeps him afloat. That's why I still have him as a top five running back this week. And like, I'm not suggesting you should bench Kamara, but I do think we need to like bake in a little bit of extra downside risk, even though this isn't a bad matchup. Like the Tampa Bay defense has not been that great this season. So there's some reasons for optimism, but yeah, I kind of want to see it with Spencer Rattler and Jake Hayner, like operating a competent offense before I'm willing to rank Kamara ahead of some of these other guys. Yeah, and I would even point to the center and guard combination where this team is missing their best players and they open the season uh, with them. And again, Rich Rebar, Sharp Football Analysis, the worksheet had an awesome stat here. He has 30 runs this season with Eric McCoy and Cesar Ruiz off the field. And those, he's averaging 3.4 yards per carry uh, and failing to gain yardage on 26% of those runs. On 37 runs with both those guys, again, McCoy and Ruiz on the field. He's averaged 5.6 yards per carry and has only been stuffed on 11% of those carries. So it's pretty staggering that the interior of the offensive line is so meaningful, but it definitely has been. And then, like you said, who even knows where the checkdowns, if it's going to be at the same number, the same rate, if it is one of these backup quarterbacks, or are they going to try to run around the football and get sacked rather than get get it down to their check down in Alvin Kamara? So, and, and that's a major part of Alvin's game for sure. Exactly. Derek Carr not really taking sacks this season right when he doesn't have to i'm not sure about these backups kenneth walker my favorite back in the league you're running back six this is against the san francisco 49ers and you are more than welcome to come back on the show at any point because he is your running back six and in consensus rankings he's running back 10 yeah i I think the consensus i think what the consensus has wrong and this is a stat um that people probably won't expect 
Kenneth Walker has the fourth highest running back target share of any running back this season. It's basically Alvin Kamara in his own tier in terms of target share at like 22%. And then Kenneth Walker is right up there with the Brees Hall, the Devon A. Chain, the Aaron Jones. He has a big time pass game role on this Seattle yeah. offense. And for my eyes, he looks pretty good at it. They're getting him out there on screens or even having him um, line up in the slot and get some looks through there. Like, I think he's fine as a pass catcher, even though he hasn't done that in college. I think that just adds like a lot more to both his floor and ceiling projection because he's not really getting game scripted out of losses like he was in years past. We saw that in the Giants last week. You know, they, they, they attempted a ridiculously low number of carries. We can get that discussion as well, but he still caught seven balls through the air for 50 plus yards. That floor combined with his insane rushing ability, I think is just a lot better than what the market is expecting. And, you know, I, I wouldn't, I would be surprised if we finished the season top five in the NFL and target share amongst running backs. But I do think like this receiving role is here to stay. This coaching staff just views him as like the far superior player to Zach Charbonnet. That much is clear to me through a couple of weeks. Yeah. And it's exactly what they told us heading into the season. Like Ryan Grubb got on the mic and said uh, that, Hey, we think he's a three down back. We love him in the passing game. And we've seen that, you know, executed during the season as well. Yeah. I mean, you pointed out 1.8 and 1.9 catches per game. He averaged in his first two seasons this year. It's 4.3 huge difference. It, he kind of went from, we know he's just one of the most explosive runners in the league can create a big play out of nothing but he went from weeks of, Hey, if he doesn't get there in the rushing department with a touchdown, then he's only going to get you, you know, six, seven, eight points at best versus now, if he still doesn't score a rushing score, then he can get there with his receiving score or just receiving work on top of it. So he definitely has raised his floor at the very least. And his ceiling is massive because of those big plays and because of the workload he has on top of it. That's for sure. All right. Jameer Gibbs, you're running back seven shortly ahead, just slightly of his running mate, David Montgomery, who will get to in a moment. But if you want to talk about both these guys at the same time, you can. Uh, this yeah. is at the Dallas Cowboys. Yep. So Gibbs, I have at seventh, Montgomery at 10th. So I have them pretty close. Uh, this is a really high, high scoring game environment. I think Vegas has this projected as the highest scoring game on the slate with an over under of 52 right now. Detroit, I think, yeah. with the highest or second highest implied team total in the state with 28 yeah behind only the Ravens I believe there so yeah just a high scoring environment this offense has been very efficient I'm not trying to overthink it with either of these guys it, it's like not even worth considering like who's the starter who's the backup no. like we're, <laughs> I'm tired of that discussion they both have huge yep. roles in terms of number of touches the one note I will say on Gibbs that um, has been a little unexpected back-to-back -back games with zero targets his target share in the season is probably lower than expectations, but yeah, I, I don't know. I, I expect that to bounce back. I, I don't think he's like lost uh, his skill in the passing game or anything like that. Just maybe not consistent usage in that part of the field that we expect at the beginning of the season, but yeah, both, both top 10 plays for me, not overthinking this one. Yeah. Just love that we can spend a summer arguing uh, just what the split is going to be. And then we get through five weeks, of the NFL season and basically each are used at the degree of other full feature backs on other teams. And it really doesn't matter. <laughs> like it doesn't matter yeah. that <laughs> it's almost a 50, 50 split between Gibbs and Dave Montgomery. And that goes between the twenties and that goes inside the 20 at the exact same time. I mean, also the efficiency these guys have when they're inside the five yard line carries and they're both getting a, a bunch of them. I think one has four touchdowns. One has three touchdowns inside the five yard line. It's sweet, man. Like, just the running back usage and also the effectiveness on top of it that the Lions are uh, makes these guys both jammed into your lineup on, on a weekly basis. That's for sure. All right. To close out your top tier, running back eight is Josh Jacobs against the Arizona Cardinals. Yeah, Jacobs, he has not popped in the box score so far this season. Not that he's been terrible, but maybe like a little bit below expectations so far. I'm willing to bet like kind of zoom in, zoom out and bet on the overall environment here. This is a guy who's tied to Matt LaFleur, one of the best coaches in the league, tied to Jordan Love, playing really good quarterback right now. This is a game where Green Bay has a pretty high implied team total. They're favored by five against the Cardinals right now. The Cardinals have allowed the fifth, fifth most rushing yards per game on defense. They're definitely beatable 
on the ground. So yeah, Jacobs to me looks really good. Things haven't gone his way necessarily in like the touchdown department. I think there's some positive regression coming his yep. way there. But yeah, this this is a good matchup. I, I think that I would, you know, have him a tier below like the Walker, Kamara, Gibbs types, but um, you know, he's he's right there. Yeah. Unfortunately, we have to work in even numbers here, Sam. Yeah. <laughs> Just right right to HR if you want to complain here, you know? Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, Josh Jacobs, he finally got in the end zone last week, right? And that's just going to be a big help. That's going to be a big help along the way if you can get a few more of those. And as you said, I mean, the Cardinals right now, I think they're allowing 150 total yards per game to running backs. Uh, if we get that from Josh Jacobs, that's a, that's a great feeling. Like, what is – let's even see what his – if it's in the pick'em lobby, his total fantasy points. Nope, it's not yet. It's 68 and a half rushing yards though right now. Mm. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, mm. Sam, we got to take that. <laughs> we got to take that. All Let's right. Let's do it. We'll keep it moving. Uh, again, you have Brees Hall to open as your running back nine here. Again, with Dave Montgomery following him as running back 10. Brees Hall facing this Buffalo Bills defense. I have some very interesting stats, but I'd love to hear a few of yours first. Yeah, Brees Hall... I think we do have to reset our expectations a little bit with Brees Hall. I probably would have been shocked if I, you know, had a time machine that took me to week five and he wasn't in my top eight running backs. I'd be surprised by right. that. The problem I think is like when we look towards last year, he was getting peppered with targets relative to other running backs in the NFL and the passing game, sky high target share, call him a PPR scam if you want. But this year, that's just not really come to fruition fully he's still up there in target share like 15 percent target share that's really high third highest the position it just isn't like a separating number at the position relative to what it was last year i think it's just aaron Rodgers like having more comfort in the secondary wide receivers you know compared to last year when it was just garrett wilson Brees hall absolutely nobody else out there in the field was doing anything so i do think we have to like take his target expectations down a little bit i'm also a little bit worried about like the coaching staff change like robert sala say what you want about him but the jets defense was pretty good like can can this get even worse i don't know we'll see so um if the jets if the jets defense collapses a little bit or plays worse then that would also hurt Brees hall just in terms of game script and things like that so yeah just kind of a minor dock on him this week with those things in mind yeah a lot of notes i have here one i i would say if anything stays the same it would be the defense i think he and jeff Ulbrich were like mind melded and that was kind of the focus and they left the offense kind of do its own thing and that mm -hmm. was the side of the room or side of the building that robert sala had no impact on now is that his downfall maybe uh but to talk about that offense here um I totally am with you about the targets and the receptions. And it's fascinating because it didn't start off that way. You know, in the first two weeks of the season, Brees Hall had 24% of the team targets. Mm -hmm. That was running back one across the league over the past three games. That is down to 11% and that's running back 17 across the league. And I kind of dug into this and tried to figure out why, because when Rich posts awesome stats, I just want to look into why it might happen to me. It's pressure looks, you know, we can think of the Denver Broncos. We can look at the Minnesota Vikings. And in fact, those two teams, Sam, are third and first in blitz rate on passing plays across the league. Hmm. And so in those instances, in shotgun with no motion, no shifts, any of that stuff, Aaron Rodgers has to say, oh, Brees, you got to stay in here and pass protect now. Like, I got to keep you in to pick up one of these extra men. And that's obviously going to impact his checkdowns, his pass routes, all the types of things. Now, to our credit, this week, the Buffalo Bills, they are 31st in blitz rate mm. across the league on passing plays. They do not send extra men. So if ever we are going to get Brees Hall back into our lives as one of the best receiving backs, because we know he has that skill, it would be this week. So it's going to be very telling to me if it rebounds at all and if we can be ahead on this at all. Uh, and the other part is, all of these runs with Aaron Rodgers because he just wants to operate at a shotgun are just shotgun runs, you know, and that turns them into zone runs. And I don't know if this team is as successful as they have been in the past, just on those basic rushing plays. So I think all many, mm. many, many factors uh, have been impacting Brees Hall, uh, where I thought that him connected to Aaron Rodgers would actually help him just like it was with Aaron Jones.
Let's see what uh, his target numbers are. Nope, we only get 52 and a half rushing yards in the pick and lobby right now. Scared to mm-hmm. me is uh, <laughs> with my thoughts. All right. James Cook is your running back 11. This is on the opposite end of that. Uh, I mean, as simple boilerplate as we can get, Sam, he already has five touchdowns this year after having six touchdowns last year. Uh, that has made his fantasy season better this year than it was at this point last year. Yeah, I think that's part of the answer with James Cook. They're definitely trusting him more in the red zone than they were last year. He's probably been a little bit more successful in converting those looks than he was last year as well. I think the other thing is like, we don't usually think about this, you know, when a wide receiver leaves a team, the impact it will have on the running back. But I do think with Stefan Diggs gone in Buffalo and them having to put together a sort of like, mishmash of wide receivers and tight ends to replace him james cook has been like the one stable piece of the offense they're consistently getting him touches every single week as opposed to last year where he was i'd say more of a secondary consideration in the offense not as much a focal point so i think yeah he's it's just like him and josh allen as the only guys you can rely on in buffalo right now and while this matchup against the jets certainly isn't ideal. Buffalo is still favored in this game. So I think there's a good path to good path to James cook getting his regular number of touches in this one. Totally agree with that. All right. One of your flag plants this week, Tony Pollard. I don't even know if you realize this, he's running back 15 in consensus. Wow. He's running back 12 for you. And I love it, man. Um, 94, 102, 108 yards in games, uh, now against the green Bay Packers. It was bad, but man, he's had at least, at least 19 touches in every game besides that Packers contest. So we're going to dive into the pick and lobby after you give me your reasons why you're into Tony Pollard this week as a top 12 back. Yeah. And going through this exercise, I did intentionally did not look at, uh, look at consensus to not bias myself. So Um, yeah, didn't realize I was that high on Pollard. I actually even flipped him over James Cook uh, before we wow. recorded because there's this minor toe injury with James Cook now. So I, I docked him just a tiny, tiny bit for that. But um, yeah, Pollard, I, I think maybe people don't recognize like how big of the gap is between him and Spears, both in terms of playing time and efficiency. And on the efficiency point with how Pollard is playing, I don't really expect the gap to close. Like I do like Taj Taj Spears. I thought he put some pretty good tape together his rookie year, but this year I don't know if it's the ankle injury or what it is, but Pollard to me just looks way more explosive. You look at his rates of hitting 20 plus mile per hour, 15 plus mile per hour runs for NFL next gen. And he's kind of blowing Spears out of the water. there. also doing better on rush yards over expected per attempt for that metric. So yeah, Pollard, like, I don't know if the juice is all the way back from his Dallas days, but it looks to me like 95% of the way back. And last thing I'll say on, on Pollard is the matchup here is awesome versus the Colts. Not a lot of games where the Titans are going to be favorites. They're actually not even favorites in this one. They're one point underdogs, but they're, they're usually going to be like seven point underdogs with how bad this Titans team is. So the fact it's going to be close, the Colts have been, um, I think, first in yards allowed overall second in rushing yards allowed per game it just sets up as a good yep. matchup for Pollard here yeah and just look what happened last week with Tank Bigsby I know Tank Bigsby right now on paper is like the most explosive back in the league but like you're saying whenever I watch Tony Pollard he has a lot of the explosiveness he had in in Dallas and I, I'm so glad to see that once again all right 58 and a half rushing yards is the higher here for Tony Pollard that yeah. might even be a first half line who knows uh, <laughs> I I did want to bring up, since you mentioned the toe injury for James Cook, who knows if it's surf toe, whatever. I have no clue. But if he misses this game, this is a fascinating conversation to have of who could fill in. Because for me, heading into the season, I was all in on Ray Davis. But what the Bills has showed us is it's almost like a 50-50 approach with Ty Johnson and Ray Davis behind him. And I would even lean more so Ty Johnson would get more of the work than Ray Davis would. Yeah, if I had to make a decision on week six, it'd be Ty Johnson. His his playing time has kind of trended up. Ray Davis has trended down. So Johnson would be the, the call for me. Another higher than consensus pick for you is Chase Brown as running back 13. And this one makes total sense. Speaking of injuries, uh, Zach Moss, which we talked about on the Sunday night recap, 
left what looked like a major injury, then came back in two or three plays, shockingly, stunningly. And then in overtime, I don't think played a single snap. So it could have been one of those, oh, adrenaline, I'm fine, Joe Mixon-esque. And then once we get to the end of the game a few days later, it's, oh, this is much worse than I thought it was in the moment. So all signs to me, at least right now, Sam, point to Chase Brown having this backfield basically to himself. I agree with that. And I'll give you another last second adjustment. I also put Brown over James Cook. So give, give, me, give me Brown at 12. You really uh, are channeling Hayden Winks here. I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> That'll stop uh, stop the slide with Cook at 13. But yeah, Brown Brown up at 12 for me. Top, top 12 RB1 status this week for Chase Brown. I just think that, like you said, with Zach Moss out, they have not given snaps to any other running back besides chase brown and zach moss this season it's been exclusively those two no travion williams types mixing in i think that signals that they feel pretty good about these two guys the, the big question honestly is like will chase brown get an expanded pass game role it's really been zach right. moss that's been locking down the pass protection snaps because frankly like they don't trust chase brown with that at least in like real life nfl games maybe they trust him like and practices or something like that. But we haven't seen that proven out yet that Chase Brown can be a pass protecting back. If they do trust him in that, like you could see him maybe even tick up higher in these rankings when Zach Moss is out because his role is really good. He's really explosive. I think he's, you know, close to leading the league in yards per carry, rush yards over expected, all those things. He's just really damn fast. Like sometimes it's as simple as that. He's not the most, yeah, like, I don't know, nuanced runner. He's not a tackle breaker, but he just outruns dudes. And if you're getting that many carries and you can break off huge runs, that's really valuable in fantasy. And then Kayvon Thibodeau is now going to miss this game too, I believe. So that's one less pass rusher that the Giants can field. Yeah, I mean, I think because of his size and his explosiveness, people have viewed Chase Brown as the passing down back. And that couldn't be more from the truth. Like, I think he has 120 less or something passing down plays than Zach Moss has. But as we always talked about, we talked about in Sats vs. Film this week, in the preseason, it was kind of geared towards an audition for Chase Brown to do all the things, right? Passing downs, red zone running, so on and so forth. And I think they were testing him for kind of a moment like this, that, mm. hey, if he did good enough, then they wouldn't bring in someone like Travion Williams or whoever else. And I think he has probably done good enough in their regard that they'll at least test him as a three-down player and then if something does happen, bring in Travion and then kind of move from there. So, look, I, I have a lot of Zach Moss bags on top of it, but Chase Brown's explosiveness has not been ignored this year. And I ended up drafting a whole bunch of both towards the end of the season. So, yep. All right. As well. Chuba Hubbard running back 14. This is against the Atlanta Falcons. Uh, you know, Saquon Barkley hit this Falcons defense for 116 yards. Alvin Kamara, 119 yards. Um they did allow 116 yards to Tampa Bay backfield last week. And this Panthers team, if they're going to do one thing, Sam, it's going to be running the football. Yep, that was my main note as well. The Falcons are fourth worst in terms of rush yards allowed per game. So that's a plus matchup for the Panthers running backs. I've seen enough of Miles Sanders. <laughs> I think the Panthers have as well. Uh, Chuba Hubbard's role is even kind of mildly ticked up. Um, over the past couple weeks as compared to the first two ones with Bryce Young. So yeah, you look at um, fantasy or sorry, fantasy lives utilization score. That's a score put together, I believe by Dwayne McFarland over there that captures running back usage. Chuba Hubbard is 11th. So an RB one just in terms of his role and usage. So yeah, 11th in utilization in a plus matchup. I think that's enough to get it done, even though there are obviously concerns of the Panthers getting blown out here. But we'll, we'll always have that concern with the Panthers, sadly. Okay, running back 15, DeAndre Swift. This is the fantasy conundrum, right? Three games against average to good defenses, and he was brutal for you. Uh, then two games against two of the worst run defenses in the league, and he was one of the best backs in the league. Uh, so where do you stand? I mean, obviously you're running back 15, but just in your mind when coming up with this ranking with DeAndre Swift against the Jacksonville Jaguars. The DeAndre Swift stuff is, is so weird. I mean, he had three games of less than 
eight PPR points to start the season and then back-to-back games of 29 and a half and 20 PPR points. He's been a top three running back in back-to-back weeks. So I think you got to start him. I'm maybe hedging a little bit with this running back 15 ranking. I do think at some point he's at risk of losing his role based on his inconsistency, but we're just frankly not there yet. They clearly trust him as a big part of this offense, both in terms of rushing the ball and in the passing game. This Jaguars defense They've actually been pretty good against the run, but overall they've let up the second most uh, opposing yards in the NFL this season. So overall it's a beatable defense. Swift can beat you through both the air and on the ground with an explosive run on occasion. So yeah, he's just kind of like a touch based volume play and what I view as like a neutral, slightly positive matchup against the Jaguars. So I have the perfect way to play this. The Jaguars are 31st in receiving points allowed to the running back position. And if you watch the Bears on a weekly basis now, you know that their screen game is really coming along. Mm -hmm. And a major part of that is Caleb being able to hold the football for like a tick longer and then awkward release and get it out to Swift behind some offensive linemen. Right now in the pick of Bobby Sam, I mean, they might change it immediately after this. 16 and a half receiving yards for DeAndre Swift. Oh, wow. Easy money. Like this might be a single catch he gets for 16 and a half. That's you know? a design screen so on the I'm, first play of the game, I think. For real. For real. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I, I might want to boost this one up, but we'll leave it. We'll, I mean, 29 and a half. Anyways, you can do this if you want to and adjust uh, these projections, but we'll leave it at 16 and a half receiving yards. To me, that is super important, and it fits into what he does well, you know? Again, yep. against the Rams and the Panthers, when you're giving alleys increases, DeAndre Swift, as we've seen with the Lions and the Eagles, he can make you pay, right? Give him runways. If he has to change direction or break tackles at the line of scrimmage, that's when he struggles. So uh, give him the screen game. All right. Man, I feel good. I'm already counting mine. Counting on that one. All right. (laughs) Brian Robinson, running back 16. This is at the Baltimore Ravens. Um, The man barely played last week. He did score two touchdowns, uh, and touchdowns matter a lot for fantasy football. Touchdowns are important. Last time uh, I checked in fantasy football, I don't know what type of leagues you guys are playing in now, but at least in my leagues, they're important. Yeah, I'm chalking up his <laughs> his role last week to just injury recovery. He only played 30% of yep. the snaps last week. Jeremy McNichols was involved. There's also, like, that was a blowout game script in the second half. So just some weirdness with the data. I really trust uh, the weeks one through four data a lot more on Brian Robinson. He's played above 60% of the snaps in each one of those games over 55% of the rushing attempts in each one of those games. He's also involved in the passing game just a little bit. Um, You know, Eckler's also going to be involved there, but they do throw Brian Robinson some screens. And I just think he's like a very underrated talent. I've always had this take, Josh. I don't know if you agree with it. Um, I agree. There's, there's a, the boring name uh, theory in fantasy football. If Brian Robinson (laughs) had a different name, then people will be more excited about him. I think they just like Swift. Yeah, or like Chuba? Swift, exactly. Yeah, exactly, 100%. So, yeah, he, his name sounds too much like an accountant uh, that works at Deloitte or something. That's Brian <laughs> Robinson's problem. Oh, I love that. Yeah, one of the first videos we ever did in the channel, it was Zamir White versus Brian Robinson. And I can talk about this because he can't be here to represent himself. Hayden was on the Zamir White of, end of that, and I was on the Brian Robinson end of that. So I yeah. totally agree with you this past week that – uh he didn't play in the second half at all, and it's because they had a big lead and just rest him so he can be healthy heading into this week. Uh, does that boring name theory hit us with James Conner? Because <laughs> this is highly disrespectful of you to have him as running back 17. In fact, this is the biggest discrepancy in consensus ranking, mm. Sam. He's running back nine, according to 50-plus analysts out there. Wow. Okay. Well, that that surprises me. I didn't definitely didn't come into this wanting to be – the James Conner hater. I think the thing for me on James Conner is that he can, you know, he's one of these guys kind of similar to the Derrick Henry conversation. He can be game scripted out a little bit because he's not involved much in the passing game. No, he's not a complete zero there, but they will get these backup running backs. I think it's Amari DeMarcado that's playing the pass down Mm -hmm. stuff a little bit. Now they will get him on the field more and I guess I'm just a little, I'm probably, the reason this rank is coming out this way, I'm probably lower on consensus in the Cardinals versus in this matchup against the Packers. I see a lot of ways where the Packers get out in front 
the Cardinals defense has been struggling a bit in recent weeks. So yeah, I just don't love this, this matchup for him. Uh, the Packers defense um, has been sort of middle of the pack as well. I'm just worried about his touch volume in a game that the Packers have a good chance of leading in. JK Dobbins. He's back in our lives. I can't wait to see him. Hopefully he has a healthy offensive line. Again, he's one of these guys that gave you two amazing weeks and then two down weeks, but you can kind of talk about it and talk through the situation in those final two with injuries all around him and couldn't unleash those big explosive plays. Um, Denver, though, again, we talked about blitzing and all that type of stuff. Uh, it's Vikings-esque in terms of limiting rushing production because of that. Uh, filling every gap, filling every lane, being super aggressive, so on and so forth. That's the problem with Dobbins here is this, I mean, basically any game versus Denver, you want to try your best to avoid playing any of the players in fantasy, either on the Denver offense or on the opposing team. They have Pat Sertan just locking down wide receivers over there. They have a good pass rush. They're kind of doing everything. Um, I think they're third in the NFL in terms of yards allowed per game. So it's a tough environment for Dobbins here. I actually don't know the latest. This is something I, I should have checked before the show. Do we know the latest on these offensive line injuries for the Chargers? Let me check it right now. I wanted to ask you about this because we got some feedback on the waiver show this week. Uh, what are your feelings on post by rookie bump Kamani Vidal as a possibility? I like that as a possibility. That's a good stash um, to add. I did write an article on Dobbins a couple of weeks ago over to establish the run. And part of that was watching every Gus Edwards carry. And uh, yeah, I think, I think the chargers probably watched those over the bye week and have probably seen enough. No disrespect to Gus Edwards good in his prime, but I, I don't not. think he, he has it anymore. I would like to see them get Kamani involved and make this a one, two punch between Dobbins and Kamani Vidal. So I agree with that. He's a good, definitely a good stash. Something I, someone I wish we mentioned on the show this past week. Uh, happy Wednesday, Rayshon Slater and Joe Alt are both practicing. There today. we go. All right. There we go. Yeah. Uh, the Kamani Vidal theory was, oh, it's going to replace JK Dobbins when really the actuality might be, he replaces Gus Edwards and we'll see, we'll see if that happens. We'll see. It's a long season. All right. I think it gets gross from here on out. Just mm. to be honest with you. Um, Travis Etienne is up next. I don't know how you or anyone can have any confidence in Travis Etienne against the Chicago Bears on the road when he's not even the best back on his team. Yeah, this is the point where if I was watching the video, <laughs> I would start yelling and be like, Sam, you're an idiot. How can you rank Etienne that high? But just trust me, wait wait for the names that come after him and you'll see why I think I had to rank him this high. Yeah, Etienne's, Etienne's tough. Uh, I do think Bigsby has a good chance to eat into his rushing workload, despite what the Jaguars coaches have been saying. Uh, I do think Tank Bigsby is the better rusher than Travis Etienne at this point. The thing is, Etienne, like 14% target share on the season. I think e even in the last game where he was down at 40% of the snaps, he saw a ton of targets, a ton of look looks in the passing yeah. game so the floor can only go so low for him unless they like completely bench him and take him off the field i don't think that's gonna happen so this is one to like monitor like monitor the reports on his shoulder injury i'm certainly open to ticking him down further if like those seem bad but i think just purely based on target volume he belongs around here he still has the receiving work and that that could be a, a big deal um We'll talk about Tank Bigsby here in, in a little bit. I don't know if I agree and believe what Doug Peterson's saying about this backfield. Um, but, you know, I'm not the one who's trying these guys out in the field, and I can be wrong with that. All right. Speaking of Najee Harris, was very wrong about him heading into the year. I thought that he would at least be an average player in a good system. Turns out he's been literally one of the worst running backs in the league, if not the worst. Uh, now, we've been in this situation before, Sam. This is a fantastic matchup against the Las Vegas Raiders. I know it's on the road. They just lost Christian Wilkins, though, their high-priced defensive tackle. And still, I have zero confidence that Najee Harris can make good on this one. I don't have a ton of confidence as well, but for the purposes of this ranking, I think it's worth noting as well. I'm assuming Jalen Warren is out here. Obviously, I think you got to dock Najee even more if, if Warren's able to come back and play, but I think it's a safe assumption that he's unlikely to play right now. Like you I mentioned, he was limited in practice today, but it, it hasn't been overly positive as of yet. 
Exactly. Yeah. Kind of conflicting reports there a little bit, but um, yeah, assuming Warren is out, I believe Najee belongs here at around, what do I have him at? 20. It's just a touch based play versus the Raiders. You know, they're making the quarterback change to Aiden O'Connell. They're still not going to have Devonte Adams. Like the Raiders offense, as much as the Steelers offense is a mess, the Raiders offense is even more of a mess. Vegas agrees. The Steelers are favored by a couple points in this one. So yeah, I mean, who else, you know, are they going to give touches to Cordell Patterson's also going to be out. They have Aaron Champ Champlin, um, a name I've never said never out loud on a show before. So it's going to be the Najee show. So touch, touch based RB two. I was about to start naming like random old Steelers running backs, but, <laughs> uh, like I wonder what Willie Parker's up to, you know, he's not even random. He was good. Let's Absolutely. give uh, uh, Benny Snell a couple carries in this game. Come on. I don't even know if I, I mean, to be honest, Najee Harris is doing his best Benny Snell impersonation this year <laughs> as a Benny Snail, you know, that is Najee Harris at the moment. Uh, okay. Jerome Ford. I mean, this gets so ugly. Jerome Ford at the Philadelphia Eagles. Sam, this would be different if Jerome Ford was simply this team's starting and leading running back every single week. But it feels like it's 50-50. If comes to fancy, he wants it to be a Jerome Ford versus Yante Foreman week. And I just don't understand the rhyme or reason for each one and flip-flopping between the two. Man, I, I don't get it either. Like, if someone has a good read on what's going on here in Cleveland, please let me know because I have no idea how to predict this. Like you said, uh, D- Dante Foreman, zero rush attempts in week one. Then all of a sudden, he leads the backfield in week two. Plays very limited in both weeks three and four. Doesn't have much of a role at all. And then surges back in week five to a 50-50 split with Jerome Ford in terms of touches. So I don't know, man. At a certain point, I I ranked Ford this high just because he is an explosive player. He's a guy who can get there on one screen pass, one explosive play where the Eagles defense makes a mistake. This defense has allowed the six most yards per game this season. They're only 12th in rushing yards allowed per game. So it's theoretically a good matchup for Cleveland through the ground. Low faith in them actually executing that. But yeah, his explosive playability, I guess, keeps him here. I actually have a name uh, further on that I will jump ahead of him. But for now, um, you okay. can lock him in here. Speaking of potential injuries, we might be getting Devin Singletary back. I think he was limited in practice. This is against the Cincinnati Bengals, which is obviously a defense we want to focus on with running the football. Um, He's your running back 22. And I would honestly like more clarity on if he's going to play or not, because if he's not, then uh, hello, let's fire up Tyron Tracy once again. Exactly. Yeah. Definitely keep Tracy on your benches if you have him, because I think this one's up in there. I assume the limited practice today was enough to assume he's in for now. Like you mentioned, I had a similar note. Just a good matchup against the Bengals. They can be beat through the ground. They're allowing 150 rushing yards per game to opposing running backs. The Giants have been competitive. You know, they had that uh, competitive game against the Cowboys that they lost. Yep. They beat the Seahawks. They kind of got up big against the Seahawks early on and never relented in that one. So I think they're just playing better football overall. So Singletary, again, not an explosive player, but I think if he's back, he'll have a pretty clear grasp of like the inside the five goal line stuff over Tracy, even if Tracy earns like a slightly bigger role. I still think like the high value touches are going to Devlin Singletary here. All right. Let's talk about the Tampa Bay backfield. Cause you have Rashad white as your running back 23. And then you have Bucky Irving down as your running back 30. I'll just place him on the board right now. Talk to me about these two. The, the thing with these two is that, it's kind of a similar story to Travis Etienne and Tank Bigsby, I'd say. I know we're going to get to Bigsby later. Bucky Irving, like Tank Bigsby, is the better rusher at the moment, more decisive, more explosive as a rusher. That said, Rashad White and Travis Etienne, um, they have the clear pass game role still. So I think with Rashad White, like it hasn't been great. You're probably disappointed where you drafted him. He still makes exciting plays. He's still playing, which is a big deal right now in week six of fantasy football in the year 2024. Yeah, exactly. 70% of the snaps (laughs) on the season. He's he's healthy. He's out there. Um, He did break a long rush, finally. I thought that Mm -hmm. was uh, maybe impossible for him. I think he had a 58-yard rush last week or two weeks ago. So, yeah. 
He's uh, he's on the field and he's playing. That's where we're at in running back two land right now. I did want to mention with Bucky that we talked about this in stats versus film. The team runs pony personnel probably more than almost mm. any other team out there, which just means two actual running backs on the field and not one fullback and one running back, which is also known as 21 personnel. So they've done it 20 times this year. On those plays, they've gained 224 yards and scored three touchdowns. I mean, that has to, again, be the most efficient, effective, singular personnel grouping in the league. Uh, it's nuts that defenses just don't know how to guard this stuff. And Liam Cohen is cooking up some good stuff with both Bucky and Rashad out mm -hmm. in the field. In fact, like a couple weeks ago, when Bucky had all of his explosive runs, many of them came off of that 21 personnel. And Rashad was the one that was in the backfield. And Bucky was like that motion guy who was getting the gadgety stuff. And then, boom, that's how they were kind of getting around their bad blocking up front, if that makes Interesting. sense. All right. We will close out your top 24 running backs with the man, the myth, the legend. Yes. Rico Dowdle. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if anyone's ever referred to him as that. <laughs> uh, this is against the, the Detroit Lions. So, Sam, just as we get a clear lead running back on the Dallas Cowboys, he then has to face one of the best, if not the best, rushing defense in the league. I know what Kenneth Walker did while standing, but in the Detroit Lions. Yeah, so this was the guy that I jumped up a couple spots on reflection. So I slid him up above Jerome Ford and Najee Harris right after Travis Etienne at, I believe, that's running back 20. So I, I wrote an article on, on Dowdle this week for Salvage Run. It, sh it should be up shortly by the time you watch this show. My main takeaway from that, and I don't want to bore you with all the details, is that he is a very average replaceable runner. But when you compare him to Ezekiel Elliott and Deuce Vaughn and friggin' Hunter Lipke, I mean, come on. Like, he, he is worlds better than all these dudes on the Dallas Cowboys. Okay. Now, that can change. Maybe you, you want to make the argument that his rest of season outlook is fragile because they could, you know, activate Dalvin Cook or they could trade for Khalil Herbert or whatever other trade scenario you want to come up with. I get it. But right now, it's pretty clear the Cowboys have told us Rico Dowdle is our best rusher. You watch the tape, you look at the stats. Man, Zeke Elliott and Deuce Vaughn, say what you want about Dowdle, those are like two of the clearly worst running backs in the NFL that are behind Dowdle. So I think his grip on volume is pretty secure. Tough matchup versus Detroit, but this is still a Cowboys offense that can make some noise. And I'm looking out, one thing I'm looking out for Dowdle is can he earn more of the pass down work he actually has two receiving touchdowns this season those have been both of his scores he's seen some downfield targets which is somewhat interesting at the running back position so if he can like maybe get trusted more in pass pro and earn a bigger pass down role that's how you unlock his ceiling and then maybe we're talking about him more in like the chuba swift brian robinson range than where he is now in like the Najee and ford range totally agree with all of that so well said all right Let's uh, do some rapid fire because we're already 54 minutes into this and we've only talked about 25 running backs. Um, the next names for you, and I, by the way, would not want anything other than to spend that much time on that <laughs> few of names than talking with Sam Sherman. All right. Javante Williams is your running back 25. Then we get Ramondre Stevenson as running back 26. That's against the Houston Texans. Damian Pierce. Yes. Maybe back in our lives. He has returned to practice. I'm assuming you believe that he is just going to instantly supplant the likes of Cam Akers and Dario Gumbawale. So pick any one of those three names to talk about here. I'll go with Pierce. He's the interesting one. Definitely keep your eye on the practice reports, but I would think he can instantly pass Akers and Agumbawale. I mean, Agumbawale is just like a glorified pass protect protector, and Cam Akers lost his job to the glorified pass protector. I think there's like a bit of a ceiling here too. Like Pierce, he's not a three down back. He's not a complete player, but we're talking about a matchup versus the New England Patriots where the Texans could decide just to run the ball a million times and go home because the Patriots are going to be that bad. Their defense is going to destroy uh, Drake May in his opening game, sadly, I fear, as a Patriots fan. So yeah, he's kind of an upside swing in this range, I think, Damian Pierce. And then quickly with Ramondre, it's all about if you think the Patriots are going to be competitive, like rarely are they going to be competitive for four quarters, but even if for a half, they're going to be yeah. competitive. And last week was, they were favored. Let's not forget that. They were favored by a point against the Miami Dolphins. How, when's the next time we think the New England Patriots can be favored this season? Never. 
So they're facing Houston Texans this week. That spread is massive. So just think about that when shoving in Ramondre in your lineups versus, you know, the production that he's given you in games where they were close contests. Um, all right. Three more names here at running back 28, Trey Sermon. Running back 29, Tank Bigsby. Then you get Bucky Irving. And I'll just throw the other two on here too. Austin Eckler yeah. as running back 31, then Tyler Algier as running back 32. Yeah, a couple notes. Uh, Sermon, I'd say he actually popped up in the practice, or sorry, the injury report this week. Oh. So good if you're like really deep leagues, desperate running back, maybe add Tyler Goodson as an insurance policy. He could get a spot start this week. I do think Jonathan Taylor is still going to be out. And then on Tyler Algier, all the things that make Bijan the number two running back for me this week make Algier a pretty good play in this running back three range. I just think like there's some 15 Tyler Algier carries games in the range of outcomes here if the Falcons just completely blow out the Panthers. Yeah. The Panthers defense might turn any opposing backfield into the Detroit Lions. You know, we can get two guys home. So exactly. It's just uh just something to think about. All right. We'll close this out with the final four names. That's Alexander Madison against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Tajay Spears. We already talked about Tony Pollard. Tyrone Tracy, who we've mentioned as well. And it's only fitting we close this thing out with Justice Hill. Anything you want to say about any of those guys? Yeah. Um, what do I want to say about these guys? Alexander Madison. <laughs> you don't have to say anything <laughs> if you don't want to. Yeah, I think we know the deal with these guys. I mean, Madison, I'll just say, I expect even if Samir White's back, he would be the Raiders running back I'd prefer to play. Um, yeah, Tyrone Tracy was very good in his debut, even though he has some flaws. Like, if you're desperate, I think he's okay to, to throw out there again. Besides that, I think we know the deal with Justice Hill. You're hoping for a PPR scam. You're hoping for six or seven catches, and he can get there. Absolutely love that. All right, I'm going to enter this pick em entry for all of you to see because I feel good about this one. Bijan Robinson, higher 99 and a half rushing yards. Josh Jacobs, higher 68 and a half rushing yards. Tony Pollard, higher 58 and a half rushing yards. DeAndre Swift, higher 16 and a half receiving yards. Again, I'll be pinning that in the top, in the comment down below the top one uh, or producer Weez will, let's be honest and play it with us. Support underdog. I feel really good about the uh, Tony Pollard and DeAndre Swift factor in that. DeAndre Swift, that might be my favorite square of the weekend. Yeah, uh, that's my favorite as well. And a half yeah. Receiving yards. Um, all right. Sam will be back with us tomorrow with the wide receivers. I'll do my best, uh, depending on the schedules that we have not discussed as of right now, to get it out within, I don't know, two hours of Thursday Night Football. And if not, if we can't do that, then we would just not be including the Thursday Night Football players because then that automatically dates it. So keep that in mind. Also, no quarterbacks and tight ends rankings this week. That's on me. It's a wedding on the in-law side, so you know I cannot miss that for the world. Uh, so I will be out on Friday, but we'll definitely be back here Sunday morning for the Start Sit Show. And if you're looking for the Sickos, Sam, you can tell the people where to find that. That's in the waiver wire episode with the defense section in there. All right. Shout out to Producer Weez. Shout out to Sam. Shout out to all of you. Hit that subscribe button. Thumbs up on as well. Go play an underdog. Enter promo with the show. Up the villa. We'll talk to y'all soon. See ya. See ya.